Welcome to episode number six in this series, Worship in the Wilderness. Last week, we entered the court. We looked at the brazen altar. We saw how this is a, a picture. This was a picture of the Lord Jesus. We saw that it is linked with the gifts on the altar, the offerings. We saw it from Matthew 23 that the altar is more important than the gifts because the gifts are associated with the altar. And we saw that these offerings, the sacrifices, the gifts brought on the altar also speak of the Lord Jesus, either in his life, the meal or grain offering, or in his death, the, the other offerings. We saw that the offerings are either connected with worship that those are the sweet savor offerings, the sweet aroma offerings, the burnt offering, the meal or grain offering, and the peace offering. They were there for the, the pleasure of God, connected with our worship. And then we saw that there is the that there are the, the sin and trespass offering connected with restoration of fellowship, of communion, intimacy, whatever word you want to use. Um, after sin has come in. So after a believer has sinned and that fellowship is interrupted, there needs to be confession. And this is depicted in the sin and trespass offering and things are restored to what they were before. We also looked at the laver, which uh, speaks of self-judgment by applying the word of God, the water, to our lives. We saw that it was made from the, the women's mirrors and we saw that this is an ongoing daily process or supposed to be a daily process in our lives just as these uh, priests whenever they did service whenever they wanted to enter the tabernacle they had to wash their hands and their feet now today we're going to uh, get to the tabernacle itself. We've, we've been on, we started outside, let's say in the wilderness, and we've come through the door, the door that speaks of conversion. We've been on Christian ground, as it were, in the court, where we looked at these two brazen objects, but we eventually want to enter into the tabernacle, enter into there where God dwells. But before we can do that, we need to look at the building. Now we're going to do that today and next week. I decided to, what initially was uh, supposed to be one session, I cut that into two, uh, look at some aspects today and finish uh, God's building uh, that subject finish that next week so we're going to look at part of that today we're going to look at let's say the walls and the entrance we'll look at the roof uh, in our next study but just because of time and I don't want to you know I uh, I'm told every now and then that I'm too long and uh, I want to prevent that from happening by looking at everything in one go, there is much to be looked at. So we're taking up part of it today, part of it next week. One other thing I'd like to mention is that when we look at these things, when we look at the meanings or the types or the figures of certain parts, I'm not saying that this is the application we're making. When, when, once you start reading various books, commentaries on this subject, you will find out that various expositors look at things from different ways. I'll, I'll mention a few approaches uh, here and there, uh, maybe today, but I'll just give you some suggestions, something you need to think of, to consider for yourself, you know, to prove whether these things are so, just as the Bereans did in the days of Paul. So today we're start, we'll start looking at um, the building and we here you have again that overview and we've, we've started outside we've just looked at that 
and we'll be uh, going to look at some aspects of the house of God, God's building. Now, obviously, we'll start at the front. We've seen um, that, you know, when we, where the sun rises on the east, that's where the front of the tabernacle is. That's where the first light is shed. And this is how we want to start. We'll start at the entrance, the curtains and the pillars. And it's only two verses. It's the last two verses of chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26, verse 36. And thou shalt make for the entrance of the tent a curtain of blue, purple, scarlet, twine vices of embroidery. Thou shalt make for the curtain five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five bases of copper for them. <coughs> Those are the two verses we want to look at. Our main focus will be on the walls. Now, when we look at the house of God in the New Testament, uh, both Paul and Peter used the temple, of course, because the tabernacle was no longer there. They could refer to an actual physical temple that was there in Jerusalem. We need to look back whether it is to the temple or to the tabernacle because both are no longer there. But they could refer to the temple because it was still there in their day. And say, well, that temple actually is a picture of. And then Paul explains that the Corinthian, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You, Corinthians, are the temple of God. Peter explains in his first epistle, chapter 2, that we as living stones are put into God's building, the temple. And we will refer to one or two other passages uh, later on. Now, I'm just saying this be, uh, to, uh, to emphasize the fact that when we look at God's building, it is not a type of the Lord Jesus, as we had with the brazen altar, as we will have with other objects in weeks to come. It is a type of the believers. I know that the Lord Jesus also referred to the temple as his body, but that's not what we want to look at today. We have God's building before us. And it starts with, as you can see in the picture, five pillars. Five pillars representing five um, prominent figures in the New Testament, or maybe I should say the five writers the five authors of the epistles in the New Testament. Paul, Peter, John, Jude, and James. Some of them, their main names are mentioned in Galatians 2, a verse we looked at two weeks ago, and thought that they were supposed to be pillars. Prominent figures in the church, in the assembly. Now, when we look at these pillars, I, I, I say, uh, it says here in the uh, PowerPoint, five golden pillars, but actually, obviously, it's five wooden pillars overlaid with gold. Wood speaks of manhood, either the Lord Jesus or us as human beings. And I've just explained why we want to look at, at these pillars here as believers. But they're not just mere men. Just as we are not mere men, but overlaid with gold. The gold speaks to us of divine righteousness, it speaks to us of the person of the Lord Jesus. And we could say that no longer are we men as such as we were by birth, but we've become a new man. We've, we've been positioned in Christ. God sees us in Christ. And this is what we see with these five pillars and this is what we will see with the walls of the tabernacle in a moment. Now when we looked at the entrance, so the entrance is now at our back. We, uh, looking back, labor, altar, entrance. 
When we looked at the entrance, it was 5 by 20 cubits, 100 square cubits. And it spoke of the Lord Jesus as the door, as the, the offer of salvation to everyone. If you have missed that episode, you can still watch it. I think it's episode number four. But you can look it up on the playlist in, in YouTube. We saw there that these 100 square cubits of curtain spoke as an invitation to all. Now we have moved on. We're no longer outside in the wilderness. We've come on Christian ground and now we're looking at another door. We're looking at a 10 by 10. So another 100 square meter door or curtain or entrance. But it's narrower. It's no longer for everyone. And it's higher. We are as it were, behind the altar, behind Calvary. We're looking at an accomplished work. We're looking at Christ no longer down here, but higher up. We're looking at Christ in glory. Christ glorified. That curtain was hanging on gold. Not on wood. As in manhood, and I'm not saying that Christ is no longer man, he still is, but he's glorified. He's crowned with glory and honor. And those five, I keep putting up my children, those five pillars are a picture, are depicting to us Christ in glory, but are also talking about his sufferings. I'm referring to the, the, their writings, of course. I'm referring to what they have written to us. And they're looking at these things from different angles. Looking at what Christ has done and where Christ now is. But all that is based on his work at Calvary. That's what we've looked at last week. We're now looking ahead at where he is. And these five pillars, as it were, display that. You know, hang it on those golden rods and speak to us of his glory. You know, remember those four colors speak to us of the four Gospels. I don't want to repeat that again because that keeps coming back and we'll look at that again next week. But they speak to us of the Lord Jesus after the work is accomplished everything they write or wrote, everything they put on paper has its basis in christ's accomplished work that is why i believe those five pillars are on copper basis copper speaks of god's holiness god's judgment we've looked at that in in the past few weeks and God's judgment has been executed. And on the basis of that, Paul could write, Peter could write, James could write, Jude could write, John could write. On the basis of that, we've been enabled to appear in the presence of God. That's what we want to do in the next couple of weeks. Go into the tabernacle. It's on the basis of Christ's work at Calvary. It's on the basis of these five copper or brass basis. Now, I won't say any more about the wood and the gold because we will look at that once we get to the boards. So that's what we're going to read now. Exodus chapter 26 again. Now from verse 15. And the boards for the tabernacle thou shalt make of acacia wood standing up. Ten cubits the length of the board and a cubit and a half the breadth of one board one board shall have two tendons connected one with the other. Thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards on the south side southward. Thou shalt make forty bases of silver under the twenty boards, two bases under one board for its two tendons, and two bases under another board for its two tendons. 
On the other side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there shall be twenty boards, and there forty bases of silver. Two bases under one board, and two bases under another board. And for the rear of the <laughs> tabernacle, westward, thou shalt make six boards. And two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle and the rear. And they shall be joined beneath, and together shall be united at the top to, thereof to one ring. Thus shall it be for them both. They shall be for the two corners, and there shall be eight boards in their bases of silver, sixteen bases, two bases under one board, and two bases under another board. And thou shalt make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five boards for the boards of this side of the tabernacle at the rear westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards reaching from one end to the other. And I shall overlay the boards with gold and make of gold their rings, the receptacles of the bars, and shall overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt set up the ta tabernacle according to its fashion as hath been shown thee on the mountain. This is what we have. We have just read. We'll get a picture in a moment. Boards 75 centimeters wide and 5 meters high. It's good to keep those dimensions in, in your mind uh, for when we move on. The whole of the tabernacle <coughs> is 10 cubits wide, 30 cubits long. 5 by 15 meters uh, the size of a trailer of a lorry the sockets made out of silver 32 kilograms roughly 75 pounds each solid ground we'll see how that is important then we have these the uh, these three materials again silver is redemption and the silver used for the, the 100 bases um, came from the atonement money, I think that's in number three, where every Israelite had to pay half a shekel of silver for atonement money, for atonement. That was in total 100 talents, and these 100 talents are here used for 100 bases. Then, we have the boards out of acacia wood, and as I already mentioned, that speaks to us of manhood or humanity. And then they were overlaid with gold, which speaks to us of divine righteousness. Now, we'll come back to the materials, of course, in a moment. This is how things might have looked. Obviously, there needs to be a roof on top. But this is as far as we will go today. The, we've looked at the entrance, now we'll be looking at the, uh, at the outer walls. We're not looking at the veil yet, that's for um, weeks to come. But what does it mean? What does, does this building suggest to us? Now, I'm not going to, I think I'm not going to follow the order that we have in the on the screen, but I think by now you're you're used to that. I'm not such a, a PowerPoint man. I want to, you know, be free in, in my order rather than just ticking, you know, the points on the list. But I want to start with, obviously, is what is on the floor, what is on the wilderness floor, and those are the silver sockets. These silver sockets are the basins the foundation, as it were, for the actual tabernacle. Often when we refer to the tabernacle, we refer, we refer to the whole, we mean the whole thing. We mean um, the courts, everything that is in it, etc., etc. We will find out next week what the tabernacle really is. That's not everything. But just for, to make, to keep things simple, we're looking at the tabernacle building. And we're looking at the walls. Those walls all stand 
on silver basis, on silver feet, we could say. Now, as the walls are made out of wood, manhood, and as we've already seen from the New Testament, the house of God refers to all believers together, we can say that those boards standing upright, one next to the other, represent the believers. They're standing upright. It, it says that um, in verse 15, the boards thou shalt make of acacia wood standing up or standing upright. This is only possible on the basis of redemption. You know, I was just thinking of that uh, lady in the Gospel of Luke that is bent over. She couldn't look up. She couldn't stand up. It was only possible when the Lord Jesus intervened. Now, the same thing we have here. Standing up on the basis of redemption. Redemption also separates us from the world. We have also seen that, you know, when we moved out of Egypt, that separates us, conversion, uh, the Passover picture of conversion, separates us from the world. We have a different destination, we have different interests. We become a new man, separated from the things of this world. That is the first thing I want to look at. Now, just to go to the um, final point in the screen, we've read that each board had two talents. And the, the word for talents really means hands. Those two talents, as it were, grasped into the two bases to give stability. We could link that with the twofold uh, aspect of the Lord's work. He was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. That's in Romans 4.25. Two elements, two aspects of his work, both very important. Then, I've already said that these boards that they speak to us of believers covered in gold just like the pillars at the entrance wood covered in gold when we were still outside everything is made out of copper or brass you know, in the court everything is copper or brass the first time you see gold is when you you turn your eyes to God's building. That is where you see the gold. In the court, it is God's holiness that is in view. We've, we've looked at that last week. When we get to the tabernacle itself, God's building, God's glory is in view. And we've already seen and that it speaks to us of the glorified Christ. After Christ was glorified, he gave the Holy Spirit. That's in Acts 2. This is where um, the church was first formed. He's made us co heirs. We have been given a position by God with Christ. Now, that I, I would like to link that with the boards and the pillars. We are no longer, as I already said, we're no longer just men. No, we are associated with the Lord Jesus. God does see us in him. This is how God sees us. Now, I already mentioned Remember the size of the boards. Now, I also want you to remember, God sees us 
in Christ. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, I've already said that these believers stand upright. That gives stability. But there's more stability needed than just standing upright. Because these, uh, these boards could still move independently one from another. And that needs to stop. Paul says that it is not good for us to be moved with every wind of doctrine in Ephesians 4. And it would be winds in the wilderness. And in order to survive the storms and the winds in the wilderness, there needs to be cohesion. There needs to be togetherness. That's the third point. But before we get there, I'd like to mention one more thing in relation to standing up. Or standing upright. Four times in uh, the book of Acts, we read about Peter and Paul standing up. Uh, at least three times with Peter, at least once with Paul. I'll give you the verses, they're not in the, in the PowerPoint. It's in Acts 1 verse 15, 2 verse 14, 15 verse 7. Those three relate to Peter. And then 27 verse 21, the, uh, that refers to Paul. Now, what do they do? They stand up for God's, for Christ's interest. It's no time to look at the, the, the four incidents, but they stand up every, every uh, of these four times. The, uh, the phrase standing up, Peter standing up, Paul standing up, and they stood for something. Remember that these boards were 10 cubits high. 10. Responsibility. We have the responsibility to stand for God in this world. When it comes to the truth, that's Acts 15. When it comes to the gospel, that's Acts 2. When it comes to difficult circumstances, that's Acts 27. When it comes to dealing with current events, that's Acts chapter 1. Standing up for the Lord. And I want to challenge us, you and me, to stand up for him, for his glory. But we also find that whenever Peter and Paul did this, they, did, they, they weren't alone. Okay, they were speaking. Maybe they were speaking on behalf of others present. But they were not alone. And this is really what I want to link with the third point. The being fitted together. It's, important, it's, it's good to read that verse in Ephesians chapter 2. Where Paul speaks about that building. And he says in verse 21. In whom, that is in Christ, Jesus Christ. In whom all the building fitted together increases to a holy temple in the Lord. The whole building fitted together. All these pillars, all the, sorry, all these boards were standing on two silver bases. But there, if there was nothing else, there would be no interconnection. They would be all by themselves. But that doesn't work like that. Christ makes sure that everything is fitted together. In a moment we'll look at two things. How they are fitted together. Two ways of God's provision for us in order to give us stability. But the number five speaks to us of dependence. Dependence, man depending on God. Now, obviously, what we are looking at here is not what we've made out of it, because then there would, would be hundreds, maybe thousands of different tiny little tabernacles. 
We're looking at how God meant it to be. And as far as the New Testament is concerned, there's only one church. Oh yes, we have the local churches, but when we look at the church or the assembly, we're not looking at the Roman Catholic assembly, the Pentecostal church and the, the, the Baptists and the Reformed this and the Reformed that. No, there is the church, God's building. And this is what we see here as well. God has given everything that is necessary for the church to fit together, to give it stability, to give it what it needs to hold together. Now, maybe it's good to look at that slide now. Then we'll go back to the previous one. Here you see, you know, the, the tabernacle looked at from the back um, how it might have been. We don't know exactly. You know, I've, I've read that uh, description of the bars uh, maybe dozens of times. And it's not entirely clear to me, and it's not entirely clear to many expositors how exactly uh, this looked like. But many look at it in, in a similar fashion to what you have on your screen now. Four bars on the outside and one going through the midst. Now if you look closely at the right of your screen, there, between prophets and evangelists, there's a little something sticking out of uh, the wall, as it were. That's the fifth bar. The fifth bar going straight through the other bars. That's the invisible one. We'll look at that later. Four things that give stability. Now, we've already been looking at Ephesians a couple of times. Um, the wind of doctrine that's in Ephesians 4 if I remember correctly we've looked at Ephesians 2 where the whole bu uh, building is fitted together and God's provision for that to be fit together is found in those four groups of gifts the Apostles and the prophets of the New Testament those are the ones who laid the foundation Paul explains in Ephesians 4 and in, in, in Ephesians 2 they have done their work. There are no more apostles. An apostle um, was supposed to have been with the Lord for his three and a half years of public, of public ministry. You read that in Acts, Acts chapter 1. Paul was added to that after he had a, a wonderful meeting with the glorified Christ. But he, 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 he tells us that he is an exception. He is a, someone who was born too late. I'm just using my own words. No one today can claim that he was there when the Lord Jesus had his three years of public ministry. I think we can all agree on that. Same applies to, to the prophets. Not that they had to be with the Lord but uh, for those three and a half years. But they laid the foundation. That means their work is finished. And we could probably link uh, two of the, the five pillars, Jude and James, to the prophets. They, uh, they've done their work. We have their ministry still with us. The same applies to the apostles, of course, in, in the writings of the New Testament. But their work is finished. It doesn't mean that there is not prophecy. That is different. When we look at the gifts in Ephesians 4, they're not talents, so as in, in other places like, for instance, 1 Corinthians, chapters 12 to 14. But here they are persons. Apostles and prophets are no more. The gift of prophecy still is there. And then we come to, come to the last two groups, the evangelists, those who preach the gospel, and the pastors and teachers very often we see these two the last two disconnected we, we we hear about those who are good teachers and others and they are very rare unfortunately good pastors good shepherds because that's what the word really is but really the word of god puts them together in one group you cannot say i'm just there for the teaching and i don't want to have anything to do with the problems of the believers 
these two link together. But these poor groups of persons, they give stability to the building. They give stability to the church today. The apostles and the prophets in their New Testament writings and the evangelists, they add, as it were, of course it's the work of the Holy Spirit, but they're, they're collecting new building material, as it were. And the pastors and the teachers, they instruct, they shape, they nourish, they feed. Those things are necessary for us as believers to stick together. That's one way to look at it. On the left of your screen, you have four others. And that's in Acts chapter 2, 42, where we find that which is sometimes called, uh, are called the four pillars of the church. It's a bit of an overlap because the apostle t apostles' teaching is mentioned. Well, we have the apostles on the other side and we have the teachers on the other side. But the apostles' teaching, the exposition of the New Testament, the principles of the church, the principles of God for our lives, that's one thing. The other very important and very much neglected thing is fellowship. Us as believers coming together, and this I firmly believe is not just being together for a church meeting, for an assembly meeting. This is daily life. Spending time with each other. It is vital for our well-being as believers together. Another very important point, very much neglected today, is the breaking of bread. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that this should happen often. And I don't want to point fingers. I don't like doing that. But this is a problem. In general, there are churches who do this, I don't know, once a month, once a quarter, once a year. That's not often. Brian Reynolds, in his uh, booklet on musical instruments and, and worship, he makes a very um, good statement about this. And he says, the remarkable thing is, those fellowships or those churches, I can't ex uh, remember the exact wording, but he says something along the lines of those churches who have changed the often for the breaking of bread to, let's say, uh, once every three months, have not done the same thing when it comes to the collection. You know, in, in Hebrews, also in 1 Corinthians, those two things are very much linked together collection on the first day of the week. That's still done every day, but the breaking of bread isn't. The Lord Jesus requested us to announce his death to break the bread. It's vital. Prayer. Prayer is, yeah, I cannot say most vital because they're all very important, but I think we underestimate the power of prayer. Well, I've been, been reading uh, the last few days in the book about George Muller. Most of us know him and know of him and have read about him. But it's good to be reminded of that again and see how, how he depended on prayer. How his work depended on prayer. And in, in today's currency, he prayed together roughly 113 million pounds. So it will be somewhere between 140 and 150 million dollars. He never asked for a penny. It was all in answer to prayer. He asked for every penny, but not to people. He asked his God and Father. And that's just, well, just in inverted commas, of course. That's one example. There's, there's plenty more. And the, the supreme example, of course, is the Lord Jesus, who spent much time in prayer, who prayed when he chose his 12 disciples, spent the night in prayer. I think that we can all improve in that aspect of our lives. Prayer is vital. Prayer gives stability. And 
we can pray to, uh, pray alone. But we can also pray together. Oh, yes, in, in a prayer meeting, in a church meeting, but also with friends in the family. Prayer is vital. But now we still have one bar that is missing. I would suggest to you that not a missing link, it's a missing bar, as in not visible. That's the Lord Jesus. He is the center of everything. He is running straight through the boards. He should be the center of our lives. Look at the link in with Matthew 18:20, as far as church meetings are concerned. When we are gathered together to his name, he promises to be in the midst. But I don't want to link it with just that. He should be and wants to be the center of our lives. That again gives stability. We need him for a stable life. Now, I told you to remember two things. The size of the boards, 75 centimeters wide and five meters high. And I asked you to remember that God sees us in Christ. And I want to link that with no windows. Now maybe you think, what, what, what is he getting at? If you look at this picture, of course the roof is missing, but you see there is, there are no windows. So what, was the priest doing his work in utter darkness? No, he wasn't. He was, there was light in the tabernacle. We'll look at, in a few weeks of time, we'll look at the, the lampstand or the, or the candlestick on which the candlestick speaks of the Lord Jesus, on which were seven lamps, in it was oil, oil speaks of the Holy Spirit, those seven lamps were lit, were supposed to be burning, and give light. Now, look at the walls. If you, if, if you look closely, you can see that there is reflection in the, in the tabernacle. Why is that? Because all the walls are made out of gold. It's, it's the gold that you see. It was made out of wood and gold, but it's the gold that you see. That gold reflects the light. Okay? That gold reflects the light. So the shinier an object is, the more it reflects the light. As I said earlier, inside the tent, all metal is gold. There's a lot of reflection. That is how God wants it to be. Now we go back to the boards. The boards are made out of acacia wood. I'm just looking for the picture of the acacia tree. There we have it. Just look at the the tree, it's pretty dead in, in the picture, that's not the point. The point I want to make is, this tree is not fit for making boards of 75 centimeters wide and 5 meters high. I would suggest to you that they have to piece smaller pieces of timber together in order to make the boards. Something that didn't fit together was put together in order to make these boards. We've looked at these boards as believers. Maybe you could say individual believers, but I would want to suggest to you that those um, 48 boards represent all believers. And there's not just 48 believers. I think we will all agree on that. And when we look at the church as a whole. But even if we would look at a, a local church, a local assembly, we find people of different um, different corners of society brought together. When people form a club or a society, 
It is because they have a common interest. They're all playing chess. They're all playing golf. Or they're all lawyers in their you know, professional society or accountants or doctors. But they have something in common. Now, when you look at the church, they all fit together. That's the point. When you look at the church, all these different groups, these chess players, these golf players, the doctors, the lawyers, the farmers, whatever, they all come together. They don't fit together, humanly speaking. But because God is involved, God puts them together. He fits them together and makes them into something that is useful in his house. Do when you think of Solomon's temple, everything was prepared in such a way that when uh, you know a, a block of stone, marble, I can't remember exactly the materials used in, in the stones, but when a when a stone appeared at the building site, it didn't need a hammer or a chisel. It was fit for purpose. It was exactly in the right size, in the right shape to put there where it belonged. It was made fit. In a similar fashion, we find that here with the boards. Those boards, they, they are pieced together by God's work, by Christ's work, I should say, fit together. There you have a beautiful board covered in gold. Now, there are those who object a bit to what I just said. They say, well, acacia wood is big enough to make boards out of a tree. After I had heard that a few times, a couple of years ago, I did some some googling, some research on the internet, and I found out that indeed there are acacia trees where you can make boards the size um, we need for the tabernacle. You know, just like you could do that from uh, a hornbeam, a beech, or an oak, or other trees, uh, not in the timber trade, but there are acacia trees that can be, could be used for this. The only problem is of the, I think, 200 species of acacia there are in the world, all the species that have these dimensions are in Australia and New Zealand. Now, I am pretty convinced that the Egyptians hadn't set up a trade route with Australia. I'm also pretty convinced that Moses had not done so after they had left Egypt. Those big acacia trees were simply not available. That's the point I want to make. So they had to resort to the, the, the nasty trees that I showed you in the picture some time ago. That was what was available. It's not the ideal wood. Doesn't that apply to us? You know, from a human perspective, we're not ideal building material. But when the Lord Jesus comes in and does his work, does his thing, we are made fit for his purpose. And that brings me back to the point of no windows. God sees us in Christ. Just to go back, reflection all over the place. God sees, us, sees the light that is reproduced by the Holy Spirit. There is no light coming from outside. There is no understanding coming from the outside world for a believer. But that's not the point I want to make at the moment. What, what I, I want to apply this very practically. Just think back of how God sees us in Christ. He sees me, He sees you, and He knows that we have been bought with the precious blood of his son. And he died for you and me, and then he paid an equal price for both of us, for all of us. 
But when I look at my fellow believer, how do I see him or her? Do I see him or her in Christ? And I'm not talking about their behavior. I'm talking about my attitude. Very often, we tend to be annoyed with the peculiarities of our fellow believers, with the, the things they say, the way they behave, and the things they do in church. You know, this brother that always gives out that hymn, or he always starts to this awkward tune. He can never stick to, you know, to the pace of the tune. He's always out of tune. Look at his tie. He's never dressed properly. Look at, she's always late. These are not sins. These are just things that get us annoyed. And I'm not saying that it is good to be late. Don't get me wrong. But that's not a point I want to make. But this is how we look at each other. But what we are doing by, by doing that is stripping off the gold. You know, you and I, we're both believers. We're both somewhere in this structure. And if I'm sitting opposite of you, and I'm looking at you and just list all of the things we just looked at. I'm not looking at the gold. I'm not seeing you in Christ. Now I'm looking at the natural man. Once I start stripping of the gold, the reflection goes down. Because a wood, unless it's you know very nicely polished and all the rest of it, wood does not reflect light in the in the way gold does. And even when it is nicely polished, gold will always do the job better. So when I start stripping down the gold, and there's been individuals later on in the history of Israel who did that, stripping down the gold of the temple, the temple doors and stuff like that, reflection goes down. And we could link that reflection going down with purpose in the Lord as a together going down. We could link that with our insight, our understanding going down. We could link that with anything in our Christian lives, in our lives together, that goes down because the light is gone. It says in uh, one of the early chapters of the book of first book of Samuel that the light had the lamp had not yet gone out. And sometimes it feels as if the lamp has almost gone out in our days. It's not because of what God has not done or what God does no longer do. It's because of us. That was the same thing in Samuel's days. It wasn't because of what Samuel did or what Eli did. No, it was what Eli didn't do. And with him, the whole of Israel. The light, the lamp had almost gone out. And dear brothers and sisters, as long as we keep being annoyed by our fellow believers, there is no reflection of Christ. And of course, the, the other side is that we shouldn't give reason for others to be annoyed. But that's not what I want to look at at the moment. I want to look at how do I look at the other? How do I look at the one who is sitting opposite of, me, opposite of me? How do I look at the person who is sitting three rows behind me? Well, not now, of course, but you get what I mean. That is the point I want to make. And brothers and sisters, we have all been bought with that same price. And the only light we have comes from inside. And is reflected in us as the, the gold overlaying the wood. That is a very practical lesson that I have learned in looking at the tabernacle some years ago. And it really struck me. And I think that we should all endeavor not to look at, I'm, I'm convinced that we should all 
and endeavor not to look at the wood, but look at the gold. Look at the positive things. Look at Christ in that person. Realize that whatever he or she might be doing that annoys me, that's not the point. The point is, he is my brother, she is my sister, and they have been bought with the very same price as I was. The Lord Jesus loves me, and the Lord Jesus loves them. That's what we need to keep in mind. If we do that, things will be different. There will be a lot of light. There will be a lot of joy. There will be a lot of blessing. Or may it be so that when we look at God's building, when we look at our fellow believers, that we see them for who they have become. Part of God's beautiful building. Growing up to the Lord. That's what we read in Ephesians 2. May it be so that that is seen with us.